Okay, so we're talking about uh, capillaries now. We've made our way through the arterial system and we've identified the different types of arteries. And now we're going to talk about capillaries and there are three different types. And you can actually see the three types of capillaries pictured here on the screen, continuous, fenestrated, and sinusoidal. Uh, in each of these, we're going to find in different locations. <laughs> We're going to find each of these in different locations in the, in the body, and they have different functions. All right, so continuous capillaries are going to be small intermittent openings. All right, I'm going to have to pause here because this is... Really off. I'm sorry. Today's not turning out to be a very good day, I guess. What you did during the break is you just watched TV. Um, we watched Netflix. Netflix. I, I finished my TV show on Monday. That's because I was interested in it. Tell me what it is. What? Tell me what it is. Yeah, what TV show is this? Gotcha. What? Yeah, it's a special episode. Yes. Oh my god. <laughs> okay, moving on. So, continuous capillaries. They have small intermittent openings, and these small intermittent openings are known as intercellular clefts. And that's what you can see here, is you'll have these small little openings and even some openings along the layers of the endothelial cells. And these small little openings, um, they allow, they're, they're larger then just like they pour through the cell, a protein in the cell, so they allow, allow larger molecules to cross relatively easily. And we're not going to find these in places like arteries or veins. You're going to find these only in the capillaries, and they allow passage of larger molecules like glucose and other relatively small molecules water and ion, ions and dissolved, uh, dissolved gases. Now, glucose is a pretty large molecule, and that's basically our biggest, and then below that, smaller molecules. So the really, really large molecules, bigger than glucose, are going to be held, held in. So the continuous capillaries will hold larger molecules in. All right, the next type of capillary is going to be a fenestrated capillary. Uh, fenster, if you speak German, you may recognize that as a German word. Yep, it means window. So you can see that there are many, many openings in these cells that allow more of a filtration through the capillary wall rather than just selective kind of permeation of um, molecules the size of glucose and below. So we're going to have these filtration pores throughout the whole fenestrated capillary. So fenestrated is German for window? Yeah, fence, fenster. Okay. This is the German word 
for window. So fenestrated basically means windowed capillary. Yeah, Meredith? Throughout. So there's going to be, the, the, the fenestrated is going to have these filtration pores. These are much larger than the intracellular uh, clefts that we find in the continuous capillaries. And they allow more of a filtration. So this is sol solutions crossing through from bloodstream to extracellular fluid or extracellular fluid back into the bloodstream. Whereas the continuous it's much more selective. It's not a selectively permeable, permeable bilayer per se like we have in the cell, but it allows, it's selecting based off of size, glucose and below. <laughs> so these are designed in such a way that small molecules will pass very rapidly or very fast. Here too, however, we're still going to hold back some of our larger molecules. We would see these types of capillaries in particular in our kidneys, where we have large amounts of solution that we need to filter. We have to move large amounts of sodium and potassium in and out of the blood and in and out of the urine, and so we're going to utilize these type of capillaries there. Now the last type of capillary that we find are sinusoidal. We're just simply sinusoid. Sinusoids. Sinusoidal capillaries or sinusoids. And these are much more like blood filled spaces. And in one sense, they could be called very large versions of the fenestrated capillary. So they contain very large fenestrations, these very large openings in between the cells. And because the openings are far larger here, we have passage of larger molecules possible. So this, you should be thinking on the order of things like proteins. And so you should expect to find this type of capillary wherever we're producing proteins and need to move proteins into the bloodstream. So protein producing tissue is one of the big ones that we have in human uh, anatomy is going to be the liver. So you would find the sinusoidal capillaries in places like the liver that's producing lots of proteins. Most of our Albumins and globulins are being produced in the in the liver and can be deposited into the bloodstream through this type of capillary. So most of capillaries in the circulation are going to be continuous capillaries. We're going to find these predominantly throughout most of most of our tissues. Now, capillaries are actually going to be organized into beds. So we're going to be organized into capillary beds. And I actually have a picture here. This is a microgram of a capillary bed. And what you're looking at here in this figure, this is actually, you can see the um, met arterioles leading into small, smaller regions. And, and what, what they've done here in this image is they've taken a small little section and they've blown it up. And so you can still see that met arterial, but then you can actually see the capillary bit here. So the met arterial leads in and then distributes blood just into this really, really small little region. So a capillary bit is not like the whole tissue has just this artery leading in, then a capillary bed, and then a vein leading out, you actually have very small little pockets of capillary beds throughout, distributed throughout the whole tissue. Um, and then they dump into a, into a vein on the other side, a collecting duct, so to speak, on the other side as we move back toward the, um, towards the larger and larger venules and, and, and veins. So these capillary beds, from an anatomical perspective, 
we're going to find 10 to 100 capillaries. in a capillary bed serving that small piece of tissue. So you could go through and you could count up all of these capillaries and there might be 50 of them. Okay. Um, again, this is a really, really small space. This is a, a tiny piece of, of tissue. In fact, the density is so it is organized in such a way that we have uh, each of our cells, 75 trillion cells throughout all of our different organs and tissue types, each being served by an individual capillary or an individual cell only one cell away. Okay, so if this is a capillary and we have a cell here, so this is one cell, you may have another cell here and then another cell here, but then another capillary. So both of these cells are serviced directly by capillaries, whereas this cell is within one cell of a capillary. So we don't, it's not like you have one capillary that services a big group of cells. You basically have just about a one-to-one -one relationship between capillary and, and cell uh, in all of our different tissues. The capillary bed is supplied, it's supposed to be supplied, it's supplied by a single net arterial to distribute blood to their local group of cells. Coming up the other side now, from the med arterial through the capillary bed, we lead back into the venous system. And veins, again, this is like our arteries. This is a term that's used to describe a large number of vessels that bring uh, blood back towards the heart. And what we're going to find out is that we actually have multiple types of veins. Veins are considered to be capacitance vessels. And what that means is they can expand to accommodate a larger capacity. So they are capacitance vessels. They expand for larger capacities. In fact, so much so, they do this so well that at rest, about 64% of your total blood volume is going to be in the venous side, in the venous side of our circulatory system. Okay, these are much thinner walled than the, um, the arteries, and the biggest reason here is that we have so much lower pressure. So we have very low pressure vessels, and the lower pressures are just simply because we're further from the ventricles. So these thinner walls, they're not as muscular, and we don't have as high pressure. We're further away from the ventricles, and so the, the result here is that there is no need for pressure resistance. You'll remember that thing, the, the vessel leading from the heart, the aorta, would expand, and we need, so we need a large amount of muscle, muscle to sort of expand and then contract against that uh, that huge amount of pressure. Well, since the pressure is so low here, 
we don't have that requirement anymore. And so we can actually reduce the thickness of the wall and still have reasonable function. Alright, there are five types of veins that we find in the venous system, and I'm going to work from the smallest, which as you probably have figured out, is going to be associated with the capillary beds, and we'll go towards our largest, which you probably already know the largest. Anyone? Yep, it's going to be our vena cava. So smallest to largest. This We could put this another way. We could also say that we're going to follow the blood flow. Okay, so just after the capillary bed, we have the post-capillary venules. These lead away from the capillary beds or from the capillaries, and they actually have no muscle, no smooth muscle whatsoever. They also are uh, what we would call porous, and this just simply means that they actually have some, some openings uh, through the tissue. And these openings are very specific for exit of leukocytes. So if you think back to our conversation on the blood, I had given you the composition of blood. We have the, the different types of cells, and we knew that the leukocytes were white blood cells, but in reality, they actually have a very low number, a low amount inside of the inside of the blood. It's much higher amount in Leukocytes have a much higher concentration out in the tissue. And this is how they're actually getting out of the bloodstream, is through these porous openings in our post-capillary venules. All right, from the post-capillary venules, we move into the muscular venules. These are a little bit larger in size. And depending on where they are, they're going to have one to two muscle layers surrounding the tissue. Okay, And these basically act as uh, the second layer of drainage for blood out of the capillary beds. Um, lead into the medium veins. And in the medium veins, we actually add some additional anatomy that's pretty interesting. So by the time we get here to the medium vein, we actually have a pretty large amount of blood that has exited a variety of different capillary beds. Basically, are draining larger and larger areas of tissue. The medium veins are going to be most of the veins that have names. Okay, so muscular veins and the post capillary venules really are small enough that we don't typically give them a name. But once we get out here into the medium veins, is things like the saphenous vein or the femoral vein are going to be examples of medium veins. And these are a large size. They are actually going to be right around 10 millimeters in diameter. They are going to consist of multiple layers. include muscle. Now just remember that this muscle is thinner muscle than we'd find in the arterioles, but it is still going to be present. 
the inner wall, and that's what I'm showing here. I don't know if you can really see this picture at all or not. Um, maybe if we pull that shade back there, you'd be able to see this picture a little bit better. Uh, but this is a cartoon representation of what that micrograph looks like. And the inner layer, which is actually endothelium, there's going to be these flaps that form. And I'm going to call them infoldings. So the epithelial tissue, I'm sorry, endothelial tissue is going to fold inward and it's going to form venous valves. Now these venous valves become really, really important structures when we're talking about blood flow. So right now we could be talking about the popliteal vein or the uh, tibial vein, which is in the lower leg. I have to move all that blood back up to my heart. That means I'm fighting against the fact that I'm standing upright, I'm fighting gravity, I'm fighting all of these forces that want to keep all of these liquids down towards my feet. The venous valve is going to help to direct that blood flow against gravity so that blood will be able to flow back towards the heart. There's a couple other mechanisms as well that are going to help blood to flow back up. But in all reality, it's these one-way venous valves that end up allowing the blood to move back in a direction without having a lot of it kind of spill back down towards the lower portions of the body. So not only is there that issue with gravity, we also have low pressure, right? Because we've moved away from the ventricle of the heart. So we have low pressure in the system. We have gravity. And so this is actually very not conducive. I don't know if that's really the best way to put that. It's not conducive for upward flow of blood back towards the heart. And so every time the blood flows, and I'm going to just draw my vein here. Every time the blood gets moved up in this direction, and we're going to talk in just a second here how blood is moved up in this direction, it's going to go past and open up this valve. So this valve will actually open up, kind of like in this picture here, and blood will flow through. And as it flows through, eventually kind of the mechanisms that are moving it upward are going to cease for a brief moment in time and it's going to start to flow back down, but the valve will actually shut, and it will keep the blood from flowing backwards. So the venous return is more like kind of taking a step forward, and then you sort of pause, and then you take another step forward, and then you pause. And it kind of goes in that pulsatile motion. And the reason for the pause is because of those venous valves. So what is actually going to cause, what's the impetus for that blood to move. The venous valve is just keeping it from flowing backwards. We need mechanisms to move it forward. And the mechanisms to move it forward, um, we're actually going to have a, a couple. The most important one here that works alongside the venous valve is what's known as the skeletal muscle pump. The skeletal muscle pump. So in the picture that I'm showing here, you basically have muscles that surround our veins. And our veins are going to be incorporated in muscles or they're going to be nearby these muscles. And you know that we have muscle tone. We have kind of this continuous contraction that's occurring to maintain the sarcomere at the right length so that when the muscle is needed, it will be in the optimal length or optimal contraction. Okay? So because we have sort of that continuous muscle contraction, the muscle is always pushing on, and you can see that between these two pictures. This is full open. This is when it's being squeezed. The, the vessels are always being squeezed on by those muscles, and it acts as a pumping motion. So the skeletal muscle pump... is going to be induced by squeezing muscles that propel the blood 
inside of the vessel. And they only can go in one direction. They only can go upward because of those venous valves. The blood may squeeze on it, but the venous valve is going to shut to prevent backflow. So the blood's only going to move in, in one direction, upward through the valve, back towards the heart. Now we're going to get to a point where we're going to talk a little bit more about the physics of blood flow. Then we'll come back and we'll revisit this issue of venous return. Um, in addition to the skeletal muscle pump, we also have, every time we breathe, remember that breathing is going to expand the thoracic cavity and it's going to increase the volume. And so what's going to happen to the pressure around the heart? Pressure around the heart's going to actually drop. And so we're actually also going to really drastically reduce the pressure gradient between the vessels that are down in our feet and the inferior and superior vena cava back here in the thoracic cavity every time we every time we breathe. So really we have those three mechanisms in you know, working for us, the skeletal muscle pump, the respiratory pump, and then also um, the venous valves which help in maintaining venous return. Okay, so those are our medium veins. Um, I guess I'll jump back up here real quick. We have two more two more types of veins to go. The next will be our venous sinus. So next here is the venous sinus. This is the cranial floor. Um, so this, you're looking down, we basically have taken um, bottom of the, uh, of the skull here. You can see sphenoid bone right in here, cribriform plate. Um, so labella is up here in the front, occipital bone back here, uh, magnum uh, foramen. And then we have these large kind of reservoirs in our venous system. And these are known as venous sinuses. So these are reservoirs that just are sort of catchments for blood. They have thin walls. And they basically are just points of storage along the way. Um, one of the places is going to be here just at the base of the brain in the, in the skull. Uh, they have no capabilities for vasomotion. In other words, we cannot reduce or increase diameter of these uh, of these vessels. All right, the last type of vein is going to be known as a large vein, and the large vein. are veins that bring blood to and from certain regions. So one of the most notable examples of a large vein is going to be the vena cava, both superior and inferior, that are bringing blood to the heart. We would also have the pulmonary veins, which are bringing blood back from the pulmonary circuit to the heart. Uh, another example would be the renal vein, which is bringing blood away from the kidneys and actually interfaces with the inferior vena cava to bring blood supply back into, into the heart.
uh, pulmonary veins, you could look at it as being bringing blood back to the heart or away from the lungs. Since I mentioned that, just thought we'd write that down too. Okay, these are very muscular. And in fact, when you take a look at the histology of these large veins, you find muscle in all three layers, all three tunica. Okay, so there's a lot of anatomy going on with our vasculature, from the aorta, through all of the different size arteries, through the capillary beds, back in through all the different size veins to the inferior and superior vena cava, bringing blood back into the right atrium. But really what we've discussed is just the, the conduit, right? We've talked about what the tubes actually look like in different sizes and ca different characteristics of the tube. But how do we actually move blood how do we actually move blood through these conduits, through this vasculature? Moving blood is going to be referred to as blood flow. And I'm going to give you a word of warning. When we begin to talk about blood flow, you are going to need a lot of math. And most of uh, the students that we have here at Truett, I think, sort of despise math and they don't understand why math is so important. Well, here's an example of why math is going to be so important in a biology, physiology type class. So we're going to have a decent amount of equations and models that I'm going to give you. And you're going to have to really understand the variables and how those changes in those variables would affect the overall um, function of blood flow or uh, other characteristics that we're going to need to talk about, like peripheral resistance. <laughs> and things like that. Okay, so blood flow. Let's start with defining the term flow. Flow is going to be the amount of blood circulating per unit time. In other words, flow is a rate. It's an amount per unit time. So amount of blood circulating per unit time. And we've actually already had one measurement of blood flow that we've talked about. We talked about total blood flow. Does anyone happen to know or remember what total blood flow was, both the variable that we used to describe total blood flow and then the quantity of that variable? Q, which was cardiac output. And does anyone remember the rate? Five and a quarter liters per minute. Okay, so that would be your total blood flow. And really, if I was going to diagram this out mathematically, I'd put a dot over the Q, which just represents that it's now a rate, and I would put in a subscript rest so that we knew it was cardiac output, the rate of cardiac output at rest. Now, we have another term that is actually going to be different than flow, although sometimes they are used as synonyms, they really are not. And that term is perfusion. And perfusion is actually going to be a type of flow. So we could measure in liters per minute. It's going to be another rate. It's just going to be a, a specific type of flow. Uh, but rather than just something, um, uh, just liters per minute, like uh, cardiac output, perfusion is going to be flow in reference to a mass of tissue. So we may say, oh, the brain weighs three kilograms and we have 0.5 liters of blood flow in a minute 
per kilogram of body weight or a kilogram of brain weight. And that would be a picture of perfusion. Okay, so keep flow and perfusion sort of in your mind. Recognize the differences. Perfusion is going to be mass of tissue. Flow is just going to be a rate of measure or a rate of, of uh, blood movement. Now, the area of physiology that is concerned with blood flow is going to be known as hemodynamics. And in fact, the individual who studies hemodynamics studies the characteristics of blood flow. Characteristics of blood flow. Now, blood flow is going to be affected by various uh, variables. And you might already have a few of those variables in mind. One of them you probably would already be thinking about is going to be pressure. If I can create a pressure gradient, this fluid of blood is going to flow from high pressure to low pressure. And in fact, that is going to be true. So flow is affected by two factors. I want you to be familiar with two factors for blood flow. The way that we represent this mathematically, F is going to be flow. And then we've seen this symbol before. This just simply means proportional to. That's not how you spell proportional. You might need some help with this. Proportional. Is that right? Proportional to. Okay, so flow is proportional to delta P over R. Anyone know what delta means? Yes, it's a change. So this is going to be read here on top, change in pressure. And down here on the bottom, R is going to be resistance. So flow is proportional to a change in pressure over or divided by resistance. So our change in pressure is going to be the pressure difference between two points or two locations. And so this may be two different parts of a, of a vessel or a tube. So this may be point A and this may be point B. And we may have higher pressure here, lower pressure here, and we can quantify that pressure difference. And this is going to affect flow from high pressure to low pressure. Resistance is going to be equal to the force pushing back or the resistance to movement of the blood. So we may have overall movement in this direction because of our pressure gradient, but I'm also going to have a force pushing back on the blood in this direction, back towards point A. Where these two things equal out, you would have zero blood flow. If pressure is higher than the resistance, you'll have positive blood flow. If resistance is higher than pressure, you would have negative blood flow. Okay, so flow is going to be related to the pressures and the resistance that we can quantify inside of the system. Now, as long as the window didn't just break, if we're okay. Oh my God. <laughs> Did it hit someone? Is that someone screaming down there? There's a screaming banshee. Okay, so let's first deal with blood pressure. Yes, still part of blood flow. 
So we're, we're basically going to start out with pressure, and then we'll talk about resistance. In, I'm not going to get to resistance today. In fact, I'm probably going to take uh, another 25 or 30 minutes on blood pressure. So just kind of keep this in mind. Keep flow is proportional to the change in pressure over resistance. And we're going to talk about pressure. We're going to talk about what pressure is, what we, how we can measure and quantify pressure um, to be able to work with quantifying blood flow. So blood pressure is going to be a force that is exerted on the vessel walls. Now, even though it's exerted on the vessel walls, so if I draw a vessel here, you would have pressure being exuded or exerted on the walls there, but it also is going to press down the vessel as well. So we have, we can generate, if, if we got to go along, we could measure at different locations along a vessel. We could measure the amount of force that's being exerted, right? And we could quantify that, okay, this is 120 millimeters of mercury of pressure. Maybe here is 110, and here is 90, and here is 80, and here is 70. And we can measure that along the vessel wall, and now we can begin to set up how pressure is going to move blood down the vessel. Okay, so blood is this force that's exerted on the vessel walls. And we can measure it both directly and indirectly. To measure blood pressure directly, this is sort of invasive. What we do is we take and insert a pressure transducer, which is going to be a gauge that responds to changes in pressure. And when I say insert, what I mean is we go through a big vessel, um, something like the carotid artery or sometimes the femoral artery, and we send it all the way up to the heart or someplace within the vasculature. And that pressure transducer, a lot of times it's sort of like a balloon. And as pressure increases, it pushes down on that balloon and there's a calibrated gauge that picks up the change in pressure. A lot of it is more high tech than that now. It's strain gauges and piezoelectric devices and things like that. Um, but it's a direct insertion of the pressure transducer makes it invasive. And because it is invasive, it's going to require things like uh, anesthesia or sedation, drugs, and things like that to help maintain the, the, the individual uh, undergoing the procedure. Um, in lab animals, obviously, a lot more, a lot easier to handle because we're not as concerned ethically about lab animals as we are about humans. Not that we don't treat them with the utmost respect, but. Um, we can just sacrifice them when we're done. We don't have to keep them alive. In humans, we're trying to keep them alive. So we don't do a lot of direct measure of pressures inside of humans unless it's absolutely necessary. Um, the other thing we can do is we actually, in, in, just like we've done with the frogs, we can dissect tissue out. Um, in a rat, a rat's heart is actually a pretty good size, and we can take that rat's heart, we can actually externalize it from the body, we can hang it up on an apparatus that has pressure transducers and flow monitors, and we can perfuse the tissue with uh, mammalian ringer solution or drugs, and we can measure then rates of flow and pressure directly in the heart, hanging it off of an apparatus. Fortunately, blood pressure can also be measured indirectly. And we can measure the pressure in the heart by estimation. We can measure the pressures that are close to the heart. And you've all seen this before. I think maybe you've even done this before. You've taken a cuff and put it around an individual's arm over the brachial artery. And you've occluded the brachial artery, squeezed off blood flow to stop blood flow. And then with a 
sphygmo manometer, which measures pressure. You slowly release that air out of that cup, waiting for the uh, first sounds to begin to be heard as that blood pressure or the blood flow re, um, is reintroduced to the brachial artery. Now, this is close to the heart. Why do we do it here? Because we're relatively close to the heart. It's 110 over 70 is considered a normal blood pressure here at the at the brachial artery. The pressures are actually going to be significantly higher inside of the heart. But we're using the estimate of 110 over 70 or whatever it may be to say, okay, if it's 110 over 70 here, then I'm expecting pressures in the heart to be normal. Uh, if it's 200 over 70, then we may have an issue that the heart is actually uh, working at a much, much higher pressure. We'll end here today. Um, you've now seen something similar to this um, with the pressure or the, uh, the, the rhythmic beating of the heart. We also are going to measure pressure sometime this semester uh, in from, from you, and you'll see that increase in pressure for systole and diastole, uh, and, and we'll talk more about that on, on Friday. So just a reminder, the next quiz will not be until next Thursday, because I have a feeling that there may be some delays tomorrow again as well, but maybe not. I don't know.